Hey everyone, Will here. So for today's video, we are going to be analyzing the history of tennis. That means we're going to be going over all aspects of this sport, including the origins of tennis, the development of tennis, and the legacy of tennis. So without further ado, let's begin. So the sport of tennis originally found its roots in France during the 12th century, when a game known as Jeu de Pomme was created and played by European monks. The game of Jeu de Pomme was originally played without rackets, with players using the palm of their hand to serve and hit the ball. This later led to the use of leather gloves for the game. In addition to this, the monks typically played Jeu de Pomme either against their monastery walls or over a rope that was hung across the courtyard. According to historical records, these monks would shout the word tennis, the French word for take, as they served the ball. This became an early inspiration for the future title of tennis, with the word first being attributed to the sport in English. In the poem, in praise of peace, which was written in dedication to King Henry IV of England by poet John Gower. As this was happening, this early sport began to spread beyond France to England and other nearby countries, becoming a prominent sport throughout Europe. By the 16th century, the glove had been replaced by an early racket, while the game was also moved to an enclosed space. The sport of tennis was wildly popular in France, with King Francis I of France being an enthusiastic player and spokesman for the sport. King Francis I was notable for building tennis courts throughout his nation, and encouraging the sport to be played among the couriers and commoners of his nation. While the game was popular among the common people, it had remained a popular game to be played between noblemen from European countries. The successor of King Francis I, Henry II, was also a talented tennis player and continued the French tradition of perfecting the sport. King Charles IX also carried on Henry II's love for the sport as well. Later on, in 1555, Italian priest Antonio Scaino de Saloth wrote the first known book on tennis, which was called Trattato del Giocco de la Pala. This book attempted to standardize the rules of tennis, however largely failed since players would often simply play by house rules instead. Following the publication of this book, King Charles IX of France granted a constitution to the Corporation of Tennis Professionals in 1571. This led to the creation of the first professional tennis tour, with three distinguished titles of tennis players being established, those being apprentice, associate, and master. Meanwhile, the sport of tennis saw growth throughout England as well, and by the reign of King James I in the early 1600s, London had a total of 14 fully constructed tennis courts in use. Later on in the 17th century, as the sport of tennis continued to thrive in France, Spain, Italy, and Austria-Hungary, it lost greater favor during the age of English Puritanism. Despite this, tennis played a symbolic role in the French Revolution through the Tennis Court Oath, which was a commitment to a national constitution and representative government that was signed by French deputies on a real tennis court. Even though tennis remained popular in France, throughout England, new racket sports were emerging, which included squash and lawn tennis. In the 19th century, there were two significant types of lawn tennis, one of which was invented by English sportsman Harry Jem and Spanish merchant Augurio Pereira. The other type of lawn tennis was invented by Welsh inventor Walter Clopton Wingfield. The lawn tennis game created by Jem and Pereira did not share too many similarities to contemporary tennis. However, the two friends were notable for creating the first official tennis club in the world, which was called the Leamington Tennis Club. Meanwhile, Walter Clopton Wingfield's version of lawn tennis heavily inspired the popularity of contemporary tennis. Despite the inspiration being present, a few notable differences did exist between Wingfield's lawn tennis and modern-day tennis. 
these differences include the fact that Wingfield's version of lawn tennis was played on an hourglass shaped court, with the net being higher than 140 centimeters. Another key difference between the two disciplines was that in Wingfield's lawn tennis, the serve had to be made past the designated service line rather than directly in front of it. Over time, Walter Klopton Wingfield's version of lawn tennis became the most popular variation, being played all throughout England and Europe. Despite the major influence that Wingfield had on the game, none of his unique rules made it into the Marylebone Cricket Club's 1875 Rules of Lawn Tennis, which had used a more standardized set of rules. This new set of club rules became adopted by the All England Lawn Tennis and Croquet Club for the first lawn tennis championship at Wimbledon in 1877. The Wimbledon championships were notable for being the official launch of the Grand Slam tennis tournaments. The Grand Slam consists of four international competitions, those being the Wimbledon Championships, the US Open, the French Open, and the Australian Open. The first Wimbledon Championships in 1877 had 22 male players, all of whom were competing to win a silver gilt cup, which named the winner to be the All England Lawn Tennis Club single-handed champion of the world. In 1884, the Ladies Singles and Gentlemen's Doubles Championships were introduced, followed by the introduction of the Ladies and Mixed Doubles Championships in 1913. In 1880, the first American National Tennis Tournament was played at the Staten Island Cricket and Baseball Club in New York. A British athlete named Otway Woodhouse won the singles match in this tournament. There was also a doubles match that was held in the tournament. In 1881, two major developments occurred, the first being the standardization of organized tennis competition through the formation of the United States National Lawn Tennis Association, which is now known as the United States Tennis Association. The second major development was the debut of the U.S. Open Tennis Tournament, originally called the U.S. National Men's Single Championships and held at Newport, Rhode Island. The U.S. National Women's Single Championships were later held in 1887 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania as well. In the 1890s, an alternative surface to grass began to be used for tennis matches. This surface was made from crushed roof tiles and formed a clay-like surface, which is used today as the ground surface at many international tennis tournament courts, such as the one at Stade Roland Garros, where the French Open is currently held. As this was happening, the first French Open known as the Championnat de France International de Tennis was held in 1891. This tournament was officially recognized as an official Grand Slam tournament in 1925, solidifying its highly influential role in international competitive tennis. In 1898, Harvard University tennis player Dwight F. Davis created a tennis tournament in which the United States would compete against Great Britain. This tournament became known as the International Lawn Tennis Challenge. The first match of the tournament was held in Boston, Massachusetts in 1900. The American team which Davis played on had a surprising victory against the British team by winning the first three matches. By 1905, the tournament grew to include other countries such as Belgium, Austria, France, and a combined team consisting of Australia and New Zealand. After the death of Dwight F. Davis in 1945, the International Lawn Tennis Challenge was renamed the Davis Cup in honor of founding visionary Dwight F. Davis. The final Grand Slam tennis tournament was the Australian Open, which was first played in 1905 under the title of the Australasian Championships. Due to the geographic isolation of the Australian continent, this tournament did not have top tennis players originally competing in the games. These attendance problems eventually disappeared since the tournament moved to Melbourne Park in 1988, gaining the popularity and recognition that the other Grand Slam tennis tournaments hold. 
The 1900s also saw substantial growth for women's tennis as well. The Federation Cup originally emerged as an idea for a national tennis tournament for women that was proposed by American tennis athlete Hazel Hotchkiss Whiteman. After facing challenges securing funding, Whiteman donated a trophy to the tournament that would become known as the Whiteman Cup. This trophy was awarded to the winner of an annual match between the two strongest women's tennis nations of that era, those being the United States and Great Britain. In 1962, the Federation Cup would finally see a lot of success when Australian tennis superstar Nell Hopman convinced the International Tennis Federation to begin sponsoring the Federation Cup. By the 1990s, over 70 nations competed in the tournament every year. In 1995, the Federation Cup was rebranded into the Fed Cup. Later on in 2020, the Fed Cup was once again rebranded, being named the Billie Jean King Cup in honor of Billie Jean King, who was one of the most highly distinguished female tennis players of all time. It is important to note that the 1960s marked a time in which the amateur tournaments and professional tournaments were separate tours. Rod Laver and Ken Rosewall were two of the main players in professional tournaments at this time. In 1968, the decision was made to combine the professional and amateur tours, creating an open era of tennis. This meant that all players, both amateur and professional, were allowed to compete in the Grand Slam tennis tournaments. This decision was largely seen as one of the most pivotal moments in the history of the sport. A little while later in 1970, the tiebreaker stipulation was added to the tennis rules and regulations. Two years later, in 1972, the Association of Tennis Professionals, or the ATP, was formed. This led to professional men's and women's tennis players from all around the world being assigned worldwide rankings based on their placement in different tennis tournaments and competitions throughout the world. After this occurred, the Wimbledon Lawn Tennis Museum had its official opening in London in 1977. This museum was important for honoring important and historic moments in the history of outdoor tennis. The 21st century marked the emergence of several iconic tennis superstars, two of whom became some of the greatest tennis athletes to ever exist. In 2006, tennis superstar Roger Federer won three of the four major international Grand Slam tennis tournaments, which included first place titles in the Wimbledon Championships, the Australian Open, and the US Open. Roger Federer is highly regarded by many professional critics to have had the most impressive tennis season out of any male tennis athlete in the history of the world. This impressive feat was followed by tennis superstar Serena Williams, who solidified herself as the greatest ranked women's tennis player in the history of the world by winning her 23rd Grand Slam tennis tournament in 2017. Serena Williams also had a sister named Venus Williams, who proved herself to be a winner at both the US Open and Wimbledon Championships, as well as the Olympic Games too. Serena and Venus Williams are both highly regarded to be among the greatest tennis players in the history of the sport. Other prominent tennis athletes to have reached international and all-time success at the sport include Pete Sampras, Novak Djokovic, Rod Laver, Rafael Nadal, and Andre Agassi. Overall, tennis has been a major international sport that has received a lot of attention since the launch of the Grand Slam tournaments. Since its original formation, tennis has existed at both a professional and amateur level, serving both ultra-competitive and recreational purposes through its design. Thank you for checking out our video. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, comment, and subscribe for more additional content. If you have any ideas for a future video topic, please leave a comment and let me know what you would like to see me cover next. I'm really hoping to grow this channel and provide you all with more content in the future, and your support means the world to me. Thanks everyone!